I think it was about time, actually, to, yeah, uh, just, you know, you got a messy desk and you start putting things in order, you know, and there's always been this, this untidy pile of, you know, strong, strong ideas and the things that have always, I mean, left, left out along the way with the Libertines and the Baby Shambles songs that, you know, were never quite finished or never really wanted to do or felt was right to do. But you see how twisted it becomes. You see how, how was it working with Stephen Street? Uh, more like working with Stephen Street than than last time. Probably we were in close proximity to each other. Uh, I think I was a bit more with it. Uh, well, I wasn't with it last time, but more with him. Uh, wasn't wasn't. Uh, yeah, there wasn't too much cause for alarm like last time. Uh, having worked with Pete on the uh, previous Baby Shambles record, um, I was kind of um, kind of warmed up, as it were, to the experience of working with him in the studio. Yeah. Um, but I feel a lot of um, respect for Pete. I think there's a great artist there, you know, uh, and sometimes it gets hidden amongst all this other paraphernalia that surrounds him. But um, I was very, very confident in the fact that I knew that he had the ability, if he was focused, to make a really good solo record. Um, but one of the key things I felt I needed to do was bring in someone fresh as a musician to work with him, to help nurture and bring, kind of, put it a slightly different angle on things. And uh, so I think one of the key decisions that we made very early on in the record was to get someone like Graham Coxon involved on, on guitar. Those first couple of days, we went through pretty much all the songs that Stephen wanted to do, playing alongside, alongside Graham, just strumming through them. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Because you'd met Graham before. Yeah, you know, on a number of occasions. It feels a bit weird talking about it like this because I don't know. It's quite pers personal, really, but he's a really intelligent, sensitive. Um, man, yeah. I thought when he told me he drove a Triumph, I thought it was going to be like one of those, you know, kooky vintage old Triumphs with bits falling off and a pair of big old goggles. But actual fact, it's a fuck off big modern NASA design thing bombing across Hammersmith Bridge, you know, people running for their lives. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he surprised me with that. He's nice, he wore a jam t shirt once. Fred Perry, blinding his eyes. Skipping and dancing hand in hand, yeah, it was all the boys together. It's quite special for me, uh, playing the songs to him and like, you know, trying to look him in the eye and work out if he's being serious when he like he says that you know, he likes the music and you know he's not. I don't know how much he got paid, but whoever he was just doing it for that. And, you know, like Larry David when he. Trying to sass out if someone's trying to call him or not. And he does that. And a tip from the tat, and Winston's from a Enoch. Well, Graham is a big fan of Peter's. I mean, obviously, I mean, he's very aware of all the Libertines recordings and so on. And I think he has met Pete before, socially, a few times in the past. Um, so, um, and Graham really was very keen to get involved in working on a record. He, he, he really wanted to, you know, I, t I took around the very basic demos that Pete had given me to Graham uh, uh, and sat there with him, played him the songs, told him the ideas that I had in mind for it. And um, I just left them with him over a weekend and he phoned me back on the Monday and said, yeah, he would be up for it. So it was a, a uh, that was really good news. And the way we started the album was very low key. Um, it was just basically Graham with an acoustic, Pete with an acoustic, Sitting either side of the screen, and okay, let's 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 kind of like 
start playing some songs and see, you know. And straight away, I think Pete felt quite it, um, inspired by the fact that someone as good as Graham had said yes in the first place to work with him. And secondly, I think he loved straight away the way it was sounding, you know, because uh, they could play off of, off, off of each other. I guess in the same kind of way that Pete often used to play guitar off of Carl, you know, in the Libertines. It was nice to hear that kind of bouncing backwards and forwards of ideas. So um, we had a very good session just for three days where we just kept it very minimal like that. And uh, I just put a couple of drum loop things in the background, perhaps sometimes just to make them play in a certain way. And one of those things was um, Last of the English Roses, you know, straight away because of the drum loop it made Pete play in a much more aggressive and slightly more kind of, dare I say, reggae-fied version. And uh, so that straight away suggested where we could take the song. Um, and in the second week, we just had a session actually in this very studio where we had a band, as it were. I had um, Adam from Baby Shambles on drums, Drew on bass, Graham on guitar, and Stephen Lord Large on keyboards. So it was great. It was like a band playing, and we just kind of chucked a song at them, you know, and said, right, today we're going to record this. Right. And, uh, and we recorded quite a lot in that second week. It was very productive. I don't, I don't know how Stephen does that with my vocals, actually. Getting them sounding good. It's quite some trick he's got, I think. I don't know. He just seems to. And then when it wasn't working so well, or at any particular time, he'd, he'd come in and he'd say, uh, you know, that in, interviews you did for that last album, you know, you were saying about, oh, you know, Stephen gets the best vocals out of me, and, uh, you know, well, let's, let's hear it. Come on, sing how you can sing, and... Just relax, and I was always amazed by how few takes we were doing. Mm -hmm. Do a couple of takes, and then he'd say, "Right, just the one more, one more, and that's it. You can go." And I'd do it, and then it'd be like, "Right, just one more, right? That's what Pete, and you can go." And we'd end up with five or six, and you know, I'd be feeling in a way like I wouldn't. I'd even just be getting warmed up. But he'd just say, "Right, that's it. I've got enough to play with. Off you go." Mm -hmm. I don't think he really liked me looking over his shoulder while he was doing his thing, and then I'd come back the next morning, and, yeah. Really proud and unhappy, like, in a like, genuinely childlike way, just... It sounds daft, really, because you should be, you know, if you're in a ridiculously expensive studio, you know, making... You know, your first solo album, you, you should be proud of your vocals and you should be completely happy with them, but uh, that's not really how, how my mind works when I think about things like that. I always think, well, I'm just going to chance it all the time and if people happen not to notice that this bit's rubbish, then you know, I'll just keep my fingers crossed. You know, so to actually be able to uh, listen to what he's doing and listen to the takes we've done and think, oh, God, that's actually quite good, you know? Without feeling I'm, I'm being up myself or you know, winding down the window and shouting out, you know, like, yeah, I can sing. Come listen to this, you know. I can fucking sing. So I just said that in, inside myself, and that was enough. And then when people like, close to me would listen to it and say, yeah, oh, the album's so good. I was listening to something, you know? and then I'd rec recoil a bit, you know? thinking, well, they can't really, they can't really think it's good, you know. But if they do, imagine that. You know, might imagine if it really is. One, two, I want to. It's all, it's all pretty much in there. Really. It's all quite self-contained. You know? I am innocent, and uh, I am melody. I am nature. I am a stream. I am tied to the bedpost in agony. Uh, come round. <laughs> Pure and simple as the shepherd song. This is one of the reasons why a song like that hasn't materialised before because I've been so screwed up in many ways and so um, up my own ear about lyrics. Sometimes it's, it's been hard for me to sing lyrics that were written in a state of innocence. So as I've kind of been returning intermittently to a state of innocence, uh, I think it was time to just say, well, actually, no, I'm not... I'm not ashamed or... 
or embarrassed just to just to play a song I, I, I love to play and sing a beautiful melody and I mean there's a line in it that goes never saw I such a scene such fair maids upon such remote so green which really is a bit of a fucking weird line isn't it especially if you're singing it and you look up and there's loads of butters girls in the audience though, but you see it yeah, never saw I such a scene such fair maids but anyway. so uh, yeah, that's when you have to revert back to the imagination. But, you know, looks aren't everything anyway. So, I mean, who am I to say? I can't know, I can't believe... I kept saying it to Stephen time and time again. Like, I can't believe we're doing this song. I can't believe we're doing that song, because... And it's quite, you know, all the boys together and all the girls together and hand in hand and skipping and dancing, you know. It's like, <sighs> yeah, I did it. I did it for that. I did it for the boys and girls, hand in hand, skipping, dancing. Yeah, it's really got it's got a scary feel. It's got those jabs, those little jabs, which I always like. Um, my, my uncle Arthur's not not gay. Right? A Liverpoolian fellow, like, and uh, he had this pair of trousers that had been the bottom of my nan's wardrobe for ages. And like, when I used to go and stay there, in, like in the summers in Liverpool, like, I'd root about and I found them and I wore them. And I thought I was the bollocks in them trousers. Like, and there's a kebab shop. There's a place called Islington in Liverpool. To the road, and there's a kebab shop in there. And these trousers, I thought they gave me magic powers. I was about 15. And I went in and I demanded a kebab. I was a bit drunk and the fella said, oh no, sorry, sorry mate, we're closed. And he's like, take his scouts out. And I said, fucking clothes, give me a fucking kebab. And he chased me up the street, it was skewer. But the trousers didn't give in. Mm -hmm. They were horrible. <laughs> they were furry with like 80s pattern diamonds in them. The character in the song, uh, he, he he took the trousers without asking. And his uncle was like more of an auntie, if you know what I mean. That print of war about my nan during the war, she got evacuated and how I always promised her I'd if I ever made it and made any money, I'd buy her a little house in the country and you know, get her out of London. And then I never did. But she got moved out of London anyway uh, to a home. Uh, it's quite personal, really, quite sad. That we actually wrote that as we were. I mean, I had the title and I had half the song, and I've been trying to write it with Amy Winehouse. And, I've got a mad version, but it's only on a, only, only on, a, on a phone of her singing it, and it does sound great. I wanted to get to, to do it, but Stephen said her voice was so strong, and the character was so strong, it would change the song and his idea of what the song was. So. I always liked the line. There's a line by Rigsby. He's talking about. How he split up with his his wife on the wedding night, you know. And he says, "Oh, yeah, we were on ra we were on rations then. Been on bloody rations ever since." Yeah. Little death around the eye. I thought it was, it meant premature ejaculation. It doesn't. It's orgasm in French. And petit mort. Yeah. Oh, you know that? No. Oh. I didn't know that. Um, I do now, though. Yeah. Uh, Carl Sister wrote a book called A Little Death Around the Eyes. Right. I thought it was a great name for a song. But he's taken umbrage with it, and now he's saying that, like, you know, he should get you know, credits and. Yeah, so it's partly a co-write, that song, and it was written, I think, in 
in France around the time he was writing Don't Look Back Into The Sun and that, all that period. Um, although the lyrics to it as it is now, they're really not together in here as we were doing the album. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's got, I think it'd be a good Bond theme, that is. No one wears the trousers. In fact, for that track, Graham picked up um, an electric guitar with a, a little bit of that kind of 60s spring reverb on it. And um, I made up this kind of drum loop that had that kind of 60s kind of European, French, you know, whatever feel to it. And Graham started doing these choppy chords, uh, you know, that kind of syncopated along with the rhythm and, and again it suggested something that was uh, very kind of you know Serge Gainsbourg you know uh, kind of French vibe but there's something about it there's something about the chords so I suggested to Pete I said look let, let's um, when we get Adam and Drew in uh, I want them to play you know that uh, Drew basically did a fantastic bass line great job on it and Adam just played the drums again suggested by the loop and it really started taking on a really good quality. With accordion on there as well from, from Adam, you know, give it the old Polish uh, accordion vibe. And it, it, it has got a very, very European feel to it, which I love. In fact, I, I said to Pete when we finished it, I think it's one of the best tracks I've ever worked on. I'm, really, I'm very, very proud of that track. I don't think horror is really the right word. It's not. It's quite a nasty word, isn't it? But Salome is quite s similar to Salop. And my French is getting better and better. Uh, she danced for King Herod, I think. But she demanded the Herod John the Baptist on the plate. And uh, Christine Keeler was in that song, you know? Drinking tequila. Yeah. And is it Dora Duncan makes the trance? Yeah, but Christine Keeler didn't, didn't make the didn't make the final cut. Someone said she was tacky. Christian Keeler, I've got a cardboard chair with Christian Keeler's face on it. Now that's tacky. Right? I mean, the cats love it. And people in the Camp Villa and homes, um, after they've given it a listen, you know, they'll be prepared to sit through it live. You know? Because that's such hard work, trying to play a song when people are talking. Like, it's completely demoralising. Very, very, th yeah, hard. Mmm! And I looked at it on YouTube. It's got, it's got someone recorded it on their phone, so the quality's bad enough anyway. But then you can hear the person holding the phone just turn to the person next to him and go, fucking shit. Uh, it says it kind of quiet. And then he shouts it out. Play down the back into the song. So I stop the song. And say, right, you don't deserve this song, you know. Um. of that were written as we were doing it but 
I mean, I, I don't even remember in the early days in the Libertines, we used to get the bandits. We were a new band, and we used to get them on tour with us quite a lot. Well, whenever we could, really, because I, I, I love that band. And I love John Robinson, the singer. And, you know, backstage and in hotels or occasionally, like, on a Bilbao wall, we'd just be, like, you know, mucking about on guitars. And we always said we'd start a band together, me and him, like, called The Knobheads. And so we did temporarily in here, and we recorded I Am the Rain, um, which I'd always pretended that I'd written all of, you know, because uh, the lyrics are unbelievable. Uh, and yeah, so he came down and he stayed over, and we had a little laugh, you know, watched a bit of Hitchcock, went for a few walks in the woods, practiced the tune, and. Uh, yeah, he, he does. He does harmonies on it in the end. But yeah, I'm really proud, proud of that tune, and proud to be involved with it and him. Was it so long ago when we first hit the road? I remember those early Well, I mean, you're guided by what he he writes. The song was jazzy. You know, it had that kind of when you played it to me in a very basic. Um, demo. It was. It had that kind of jazzy swing to it. So um, it's a bit like there she goes on Baby Shamble shot as Nation Army. You know, obviously, Pete's got a little affection for that kind of music. That was one of the tracks we did with the whole band. It was great. You know, we had Stephen Large on piano, really giving it that kind of boogie woogie kind of you know jazzy feel. Drew on the double bass, you know, and Adam on the kit, and Graham just doing those lovely muted jazzy chords on the guitar, and it just went off, and it sounded great. And that track, had, I don't think, it, apart from the brass overdubs, and I said to the brass players, think of, uh, think of uh, Tony Hancock when you do the brass. Don't think of uh, New Orleans. Think of like a, you know, like a, a Kenny Ball and the Jazzmen. You know, keep it like, you know, kind of 1950s BBC jazz recording type vibe. Um, and it was great, and, and they came in and they overdubbed, but everything else on that particular track is live. Yeah, we had great fun recording that, The Sweet Barn Bar, because that song, that title, has belonged to like four or five different songs now, all completely different. Um, and that, that was pieced together pretty much in the studio, that one. Yeah, I like that song. So you have a little dance to it and if you like that type of dancing, you know. It just falls on the right side of end of the pier. Palace of Bone, I suppose. Uh, yeah. Say really. Uh, I don't know if uh, French presidential candidates who are like really foremost in the minds of the uh, early purveyors of Cockney rhyme and slang, but I suppose in a way it's like Yardy scented Jacques Chirac. Uh, oh no. Pipe of oil, alabaster, uh, which you carve out into a home, and sometimes if it gets wet, it doesn't get ruined, you know, if it's good quality, so all the little children can come in and be kept safe. Mm. Yeah, Palace of Bone was another one where I was, I was so glad to, be, so glad to have been recording it. Couldn't believe it when we were doing it, really. actually recording that song and knowing it was going to be. Uh, be released properly. Yeah. And I love that song. Sheepskin Terror. Again, I, I, I couldn't believe we were doing it. You know? It was just it was so so special, so magical. It all worked out. Perfectly as well. I thought we were sat right here, and uh, I said to Steve, "You know this song, um, Sheepskin Tailway. I've, I've always wanted to do it. I've always wanted to record it. Um, 
and Dot's, I think Dot's up for it as well. So we just gave her a bell, and within the hour she was down here and in the vocal booth. And we just, yeah, we went through it live. Yeah, it was just like Dot, uh, Was that in here? Graham was here, over there. Yeah, I think we were live on the piano and I was over there, having my little boob over there. A little trinket done, and a couple of faded Union Jacks. A uh, uh, small Italian man that I'd met that morning. And he was good as gold. Yeah, absolutely delighted to have done that one. And yeah. Wolfman he used to have a John Watson style sheepskin coat and uh, I kind of played Cupid at that time and he's still with the girl that uh, it was a friend of mine like Gemma God knows what she's doing like, <laughs> it's 20 years between them but yeah it was, it was, it was magical uh, that romance, and I remember seeing him for the first time walking down the streets, Kelly, and I, was, I couldn't believe it. I just burst out laughing, and I was on my knees in the street. She fell in love with the sheep's in terror. And then when I met Dot, uh, a couple of other verses were born, you know? The scene where they were, yeah, he pushed her hair away, hair away, hair away, pushed her hair away at night, and then. Yeah, 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 Dot, Dot and I wrote a couple of verses together, actually, after that, and in a hotel in Brighton, the Albion Hotel in Brighton, right on the seafront, you know, yeah, it's all right, a couple of nights. Um, it, it was twin beds, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Broken love song. Yeah, the Wolfman. He's got this awful theory. Like, it's quite frightening that that everything he writes in a song, or everything that gets written in a song, comes true and comes to be. You know. Uh, so I just write a song saying. I'm a millionaire with loads of nice hats, you know what I mean, and see what happens. But as it happens, it didn't. It said, like, I'm in the scrubs and, like, uh, I'm desperately unhappy. So that came to be, and he insisted, because I had a song where he was going, I'm the rat, you see, I can spread a more disease. I'm the rat, you see, I'm called the rat catcher, you can't catch me, I'm the rat. He said, you can't sing that. You can't say I'm a rat. You will become a rat, you know? Uh, yeah, and Broken Love Song is, is one of these songs that is so special to, to, to Peter, to Peter Wolf, and all that mattered to me really was that he he was happy with the, the final version because I knew then that that it'd be alright, you know, because he's terribly uh, terribly nasty and bitter when it comes to like um, talking about my music and. Yeah, critique of things I recorded, and uh, but he was really annoyed when he heard that because it was good, you know. He was, uh, you know, he was happy to be glad to be unhappy that that he kind of done justice to the song, and I changed an awful lot of the lyrics as well. You know, there's quite a lot of ad libbing in there. So um, what I'm trying to say is, I know that Don Wolfie proud with that song which is both of ours. Are you still talking to all of those dead film stars like you used to? I 
And do you still thinking of I love those pretty rhymes and perfect crimes I like you used to And if you're still alive Or when you're 25 Or should I kill you like you asked me to If you're still alive uh... I couldn't really see that one working, to be honest. I couldn't see that happening. I was a little bit, I was a bit awkward about doing it. I, I said to Steve, you know, you know why, why are we even do, going through this one? I don't really want it on the album. I can't really, I can't really see it work. I can't see, you know, it, it was winding me up. The song was really winding me up, and we were going through it again and again and again. But it turns out it's one of my favourite parts of the record, I think, with the opening, the opening bars to that, you know? In fact, I'd love the whole record to sound just like the opening bars of that song, you know? the whole thing. Um, I think we wrote a new middle eight as well and whacked that in, so it spiced up a little bit, and, and then in the end, just sort of closed my eyes and jumped, and, uh, yeah, it's come out the other side, and a lot of people... Um, who've listened to the album have said, like, yeah, I love that song, it like goes on trees, it's beautiful. And of course, I never believe him because I always tend to the negative, but yeah. It's been around quite a while, that song as well, apart from the, the middle eight, you know? If you're still alive when you're 25. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to change that to 35, right? <laughs> but... If you're still alive 25, would I kill you? You told me to, you know, I really don't I remember every single thing you said to me now Played the man and I was, I was Calvary and you said, oh, you said your love grows on trees, new love grows on trees, new love grows, grows on trees. When the cold wind that blows When the cold wind that blows In my heart Was a summer breeze And she When the librarian's already a bit pissed off with him Because he's left well, it's not him, but there's egg stain on one of the books, and and Dolly has let him have more than one book on the one ticket. But then all of a sudden he's like in awe of Hancock because he's asked for the decline and fall of the Roman Empire and Plato's Republic and basically the five or six most treasured books in the whole library. And the fella can't believe it. He's like, oh my, you can have all of these on the one ticket. This is what makes being a librarian worthwhile. And Hancock's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I found them very useful. These books, uh, just put them on the floor. He's like, uh, on the floor. He says, yeah, yeah, just stand there. He says, oh, uh, I said, okay, and now give me a leg up. Give me a leg up. And he reaches up to the top and says, there's a little beauty. Lady, don't fall backwards. Now, you barbarian. You animal. Just uh, be off of you, you highly strong fool. And, uh, yeah, lady, don't fall backwards. Can't not have that as a title for a song. Yeah. Don't you fall backwards. I wouldn't want for you to come to any harm or time If the darkness comes and I will sing you a song Well, I will love you forever Until the postman comes The 
Don't you fall back Come on and fall into my arms Come on and fall into my arms Come on and fall into my arms such a short space of time I think it's very much what an album should be and that is just a, a collection of songs which represent a certain period of time you know? and that's just kept whether the songs are, are old or new you know, or written on the spot it's, it's from that that moment and that, that period in time and it, it yeah um, it's, it's very straightforward and honest and open. It's a very personal record and it was quite a close-knit affair, you know. Um, a lot of people who are very special to me, uh, I've got Alison, John from the Bandits, um, The Wolfman, and Graham Coxon, you know, as it came to be. We were just all involved and it was a good atmosphere and it sounds really daft, but you know, these people are my friends and for it to stay on the track and for the record to be made, it's really been my it's been been my year really. It's become my become my year. Uh, I've led a very sheltered life, you know. And I think this record reflects that. All the boys together. Superlative, bang on, stonking, enemy, nine out of ten, mojo, up the R's, bang on, blinding, best of, worst of, satiate the need. Um, what a nice bloke.